Thanks, Eddie. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Greg Buerta, who's our speaker for the day. Um, Greg completed a BSc Honours degree through University of Natal, Durban, followed by a postgraduate diploma in terrain elevation for the SADF, interesting, before obtaining his PhD in quaternary geology also through the University of Natal, but then at Maritzburg. He recently retired as a senior specialist scientist, having spent nearly 41 years involved in regional geological mapping, research and management for the CGS, and previously, obviously, the Geological Survey. Much of his career was devoted to mapping, stratigraphy, geochronology, paleoenvironmental analysis of Cenozoic sediments, paleosols and Dury Cross across Southern Africa. This has included the publication of revised maps and the exploration explanation for the volume on the Maputo land, coastal plain and Labomba mountains. Um, recently, he's also contributed to mapping in the Cedarburg, Orange River Valley, Bushman land, and, and more recently, in particular, the landslide and erosion mapping around Durban and Tugela Valley. He's also worked commercially for the CGS. Um, Greg has successfully served as Secretary General of the 35, 35th International IGC, International Ge Ge Geological Congress, and is currently on the board of the 35 IGC Legacy Fund. Today he's presenting on the Cenozoic deposits associated with the geomorph geomorphic provinces of Southern Africa. Um, and I guess effectively, you know, what's gone on in this um, last 66 million years, which many of us tend to, to ignore, which is, but is, re but is a really important part of our geological evolution. Thanks, Greg, and we look forward to your, your presentation. Thanks, John and Henny, and thanks to everybody else for joining us this morning. I'm going to be talking about the Cenozoic deposits associated with geomorphic provinces across South Africa. What we're looking at is the relationship between the superficial cover and the characteristic terrain morphology and drainage evolution of different areas in the country. Most of what I'm presenting has been derived from my almost 41 years of working with Council for Geoscience. And now that I've retired, I'll be working under the banner of regolith environment, continuing my research and commercial interests, but also as uh, through the University of KwaZulu-Natal as a um, honorary research fellow. Now, geologists tend to develop a slang, and one of the slang terms that people use is anything that's yellow and unconsolidated and on the surface, they refer, refer to it as a Cenozoic. Um, more correctly, we should be talking about the regolith. And if you look at the definition of the regolith, it's derived from the Greek Rigos, lithos, it's a, it's a rock blanket. And a recent definition is the entire unconsolidated or secondarily re-cemented cover that overlies more coherent bedrock that has been formed by weathering, erosion, transport, and or deposition of the older material. And this regolith thus, thus includes fractured and weathered basement rocks, saprolite soils, organic accumulations, volcanic material, glacial deposits, colluvium, alluvium, evaporitic sediments, aeolian deposits, and groundwater. So it's pretty much everything from fresh rock to fresh air. Just a reminder, what is the Cenozoic? Well, in terms of a 24-hour day, the Cenozoic era 66 million years ago starts 20 to midnight. And if you look at the period that hominids have been around, it's really only the last few seconds of the day. So perhaps this is why people don't take it as seriously as the rest of the geological time scale, because there's a whole 23 hours to lose yourself in. For those of you that aren't scholars, watching the development of this, chron this the chronostratigraphic table. 
here's just a record of, of how it's developed over the years. If you look at some of our older maps, they'll show the tertiary and the quaternary. The geological time scale 2004 introduced a bit of a shock. It was published and there was a change made without any consultation to the Cenozoic research community. And the quaternary was excluded completely. And it now became the Neogene system. Around about that time, there was also a discussion with an inqua as to what is the acceptable base of the quaternary. And it was established at 1.8 million years. And the discussion now was looking at changing it to 2.58 million. Anyway, after a long battle, it formally got through the IUGS chronostratigraphic um, committees and the quaternary was reintroduced onto the stratigraphic um, timescale. And what's happened is now a little bit of the Pliocene has been incorporated into the quaternary and the base is set at 2.58 million. Now, much of the regolith that we have on the surface across South Africa is quaternary. But we have here and there remnants of the Miocene landscapes. And unfortunately, very little of this long period. You can see it's 20 million years of history that's just missing from much of the surface of South Africa. If you look at the uh, very familiar Council for Geoscience one in a million map, here it's been projected in 3D. And you can see the very strong relationships between different rock types and topography. So we've got the characteristic Lesotho Plateau, the very extensive great escarpment that you can follow all the way around to the Northern Cape, the Karoo, is divided, the dry Northern Cape areas and the very distinct Kalahari area, these basins, the Kalahari, the Bushveld Basin surrounded by mountains. Now, all of these are, are features that obviously affect the development of drainage basins and the Cenozoic regolith deposits associated with those drainage. So you'd expect that in the very high density drainage basin areas of KZN, the type of regolith that you'd find would be very different from the Western Transvaal areas and the Kalahari. And this is the type of thing we're going to investigate to try and find, is there a way of characterizing the Cenozoic in specific areas? If you look at the Cenozoic that was derived from the one in a million map, you can see it's concentrated here in the Northern Cape area, some on the coastal plains, but in between with a scale, not much of it is shown. And it covers a full 40% of the surface of South Africa. And I think it really deserves far more attention than it gets. These red stars are the sites that have been described in the literature. And these red dots are sites where there's been radiometric dating done. And you can see it's a very sparse distribution across the center of the country. Most of the attention is focused on the coastal plains. Now, if we have a look at the concept of geomorphic provinces, this was a paper that was published by Tim Partridge and Evan Dollar did much of the research. And what he's done is divided the country into areas where the drainage, uh, density and the slopes are all quite similar. And, and this picks out the Drakensberg escarpment very nicely. It separates out parts of the Karoo, the Northern Cape Panfelt, um, the Kalahari is very obvious, the Southern Kalahari Mountains, very different from the adjacent Garp Plateau. And then up here in the Val catchment, able to differentiate various areas. And then you've got the coastal plains. So these are individual geomorphic provinces. And what I'm going to try and do is present um, the Cenozoic deposits that I've worked on 
in the context of these areas to see that the geology and the regolith geology especially is quite unique in each of these areas. Now, one thing that you see on these maps is these lines. These are axes of neotectonic flexure. They are axes of relative uplift. And this is an old concept. Here's something from de Toy in 1933, where he's already seen that there must have been flexure of the crust that influenced the development of drainage systems. Yeah, he's got this great depression under Lesotho, and I think effectively what you're looking at there is the dip of the strata inland of the faulting from Karoo break, uh, Gondwana breakup. But in these areas, it's essentially drainage basins and, and interfluves that have been differentiated. And, and that research continues. If we look at this paper that was done by Andy Moore, more detail of the drainage systems, and he's changed the orientation of these flexure axes. Now, I'm showing these now because this is detail that you just don't get on the geological maps. It's not on the one in a million map. It's not on any of the other maps. But it's a type of thinking, neotectonics, that you can't get away from if you're working with the regolith, because it's highly likely that during the period in which that regolith accumulated, there might have been some preferential uplift of certain parts of the crust. But then what you've also got to bear in mind is that some of these features in some of these areas, you've got pre karoo topography that is also now influencing the present land surface and has also influenced the development of drainage systems and the distribution of regolith. The type of work that's been done more recently, this is down on the, the Eastern Cape, um, along the Cape Fold Mountains. This is derived from work that was funded by ESKIM as part of the seismic hazard assessment for the nuclear site at Taste Pint, and it's using cosmogenic isotopes um, which are produced in situ to estimate rates of erosion, exposure ages of rock surfaces or burial, and even exposure history of rock, soil, and sediment. In this case, um, this publication by Bienman showing ages for exposed surfaces, but then also from sediments derived from river samples giving you an idea of the rates of uplift in the area. And this has been done um, in various places around the country to give an idea of the rates of uplift of this area, which is regarded as a, a stable continental margin. Now, these are sort of detail that you just don't see on the geological maps. Let's go back to the distribution of the regolith. And what I'd like to start off with is now, what was the landscape that was inherited at the start of the Cenozoic some 66 million years ago? And just do a quick comparison of areas across on the, the eastern side, inland of, of Durban, um, and then compare it with another area across in the Northern Cape. Down here around Grahamstown and the, along the Cape Fold Mountains, you have similar features. And the half felt, also an old remnant African surface um, landscape that is very poorly exposed. But if you look at, at the influence on the geology, it has huge economic impact in that area. So let's go and have a cross a look. Rodney Maud produced this map. And from the hilly topography, the interfluves between the major river systems in KZN, he identified these hilltops where you might find lateritic uh, weathering profiles pre pre preserved, and then adjacent areas where there was colonization of the bedrock. This is what it looks like um, inland from Ndwedwe. You have uh, summit concordance, these hills that are created by the Kranzkloof member, a quartzite in the Natal group, underlain by the Natal metamorphic province granites and um, metamorphosed supercrustals. 
And this entire succession here has been deeply weathered probably throughout the Cretaceous and into the Neogene before it was incised. Here is colonized granite. Typically, the granite is, is saprolite, it's deeply weathered, it's rippable, yet the hilltops are capped by these hard quartzites that have survived this weathering process. What you might find is at the base of the Natal group, occasionally there are shales, and those shales have been colonized, and they're targeted now by Zulu women who mine them to produce pure white kaolin that's used uh, as a sunscreen and for cultural activities. What you'll also find is that these deeply weathered granites under this old land surface are very erosion um, susceptible and even something like this where a water pipeline was put in and surface drainage has been diverted along that pipeline route it's eroded it and now the gully is cutting back up along that so a knowledge of this Cenozoic geology is essential for development in these areas now the laterite that Rodney Maud described isn't preserved um, and it's certainly not exposed in many places. And it's, it's, it's a laterite, a laterite profile. This is just one of the horizons in the laterite profile. It looks like a fairy creek, but it's not a fairy creek. So these are things that unfortunately just don't, aren't represented and certainly not picked up by people in the field while they're mapping. Now, if we move across the country, right across into the Northern Cape, here we have the Kua Kopa, near Plotbuckies in the Northern Cape. This is an area that probably only receives 100 mils of rain in a good year. Um, detailed work was, descriptions were done by Dion Brunt. And what you have in this site is colonized granite. It's pretty soft down here. It's buried by fluvial sediments and the entire succession has then been silicified. It's quite unique. But essentially, it's the same landscape that you're seeing inland from Durban. If you look at this, here the sediments are overlying the granite. There's a lot of lithic material derived from that weathered granite, which is incorporated in the, the sediments. Uh, thin, small pebble conglomerates, sands, um, quite an exciting succession, so definitely worth visiting. But it's only in a very small area where it's preserved in a, in a graben. Now, let's go midway then, midway between Inanda and Durban and, and the Northern Cape. And here in the Inciswa area, Mount Freer, where you don't expect to find Stilcrete, Alex de Toy, way back in 1910, when he was mapping this area, discovered this boulder. And I always wondered how Rodney Maud knew where this boulder was. And he had obviously gone looking for it and found it. One boulder preserved of what was formerly a much more extensive silkrete capping on the Karoo rocks in the area. And you have to go a long way to the south to Kentani and then further south into the, the Southern Cape to find the extension of these um, weathering profiles. So that's given an idea of what the landscape was that was inherited. Now, at the coast, um, a lot of this sediment was obviously deposited offshore, and that's the Cretaceous succession that you find under the Indian Ocean. But the interior, look at this south, southeastern coastal platform. Um, you saw in that 3D image, this is a very high density of drainage evolution in that area. Um, and we're going to look at the sediments that are associated with that particular landscape. It's mostly um, the Karoo, in this case, in this area, Ladysmith Basin, it's the Freyat Formation. But as you go down to the Antarctica area, you're getting into the Beaufort, and Grahamstown area, uh, sorry, Queenstown area as well. 
And equivalent sediments you find on the other side of the Drakensberg in the Eastern Free State, and even up here in the Eastern edge of the Bushveld Basin uh, are the same sort of sediments. And what they are, are hill slope deposits, mainly deposited by sheet wash action. This is unconfined flow on hill slopes, as opposed to confined flow in channels, which would have given you more typical channel alluvium. This material accumulates on slopes below bedrock steps. It's either freight formation sandstone or dolerite that caps the hills and creates these bedrock steps. And it creates an area where over long periods of time, you can have accretion of sediments. In this case, the St. Paul's Donga, the base is dated at probably 107,000 years, but Elsewhere in the area, we've got dates of up to 120,000 years. And this 120,000 year age, it's right in the middle of marine isostope stage 5E. That's the last interglacial. It's a, in the eastern part of the country. It's a period when the climate was probably slightly warmer than present. And there was a higher precipitation than, than at present. But subsequent to that, there's been cycles of sediment accretion followed by incision and then formation of dongas infill of those dongas and that's a, a theme that is present right the way across the eastern seaboard of south africa this particular site gives you a good idea that in order to transport and deposit regolith as sediments you've got to have other regolith which is weathering profiles which are easily erodible. And that's the material that's available then to be transported. In this case, we've got the, the lower part of a saprolite, a thick soil profile developed in dolerite. The landscape became unstable and eroded. And here you can see a gully formed. And that was infilled subsequently by stratified sediments, which were derived from the weathering of this soil profile upslope. And then subsequently, again, this stabilized, but then it was cut. And another sequence of dongas formed on the landscape, eroding the regolith upslope and those subsequently infilled. This is a characteristic that we look for. And unfortunately, there are very few sites that you'll find that show it in as much detail as this particular area. But not every gully that you see is formed in quaternary regolith. In this, or not, not the transported sediments. Anyway, in this case, you've got deep granite saprolite um, that under the old African surface, and it's tremendously erodible. You can see the figure here. And this is discharge off a road. There's the vehicle. The water comes off the road and discharges across the slope. And look at the donga that it's been created. Now, if we go further south into the Amtata area, the geology is quite similar and set thin sandstones with underlying shale. The morphology of the slopes is slightly different, but you still get the same succession. And here we also call it the Masacheni. And Debbie Clarkson is working on this. There are some tremendous successions exposed in gullies like this. And she's also using luminescence to luminescence dating techniques to give an idea of when the bedrock was first exposed and the period over which it subsequently was buried by these sheet wash colluvial sediments. And if you go further south now to the edge of the Amtata sheet, which is here, and then um, into the Grahamstown, uh, Queenstown sheet, you can see that the distribution of the quaternary deposits is different here to what it is on this side of the sheet. And this is because of the topography that's created by these dish-shaped dolerite sills that create ranges of hills that then shed sediment into the basin um, defined by that circular dolerite sill and then off the side slopes. And in this area, once again, very typical muscle chain formation sediments um, where you have paleosols that have formed in these sediments and then subsequently been reburied and then exposed again. And occasionally on those lower slopes, if there's a steep slope nearby, you will have 
rockfall deposits accumulating and here they're protecting pedestals of the erodible underlying material. Now, if you go into the north of the Maluti Mountains up into the Clarence and Fariesburg area, uh, you can see that the distribution of the quaternary deposits there is very different from what you find um, in the Winterton Bergville area in KZN, because the geological constraints on landscape development are very different in the Eastern Free State. There you have a steppe topography created by um, sandstones, the Clarence Formation, and then the more erodible underlying multi uh, Elliot Formation. And then under that, you have extensive sandstones of the Maltino, which also have interbedded shales. And that differential erosion has created a step topography, which then allows sediments to accrete, accrete over long periods of time. Now, in this case, we're looking at radiocarbon dates, not ideal for dating this, but it gives us an idea that this is not young sediment. And um, it's probably the equivalent of the Masacheni formation in KZN, but until we know more, more about it, we'll lump this in that particular geomorphic province, we'll call it the Foresia colluvium, which is only really occurs in these areas where you have sediment shed off the Clarence Formation sandstone. Now, recently there was some work done in Golden Gate and people came from the UK, did some work here, and they looked at the sediment and it was fine grained and they, derived, they said it was now Aeolian sand that had been blown out of these valleys in the Maluti Mountains up against the slopes to form um, sand ramps. But if you look at it, the Clarence Formation is an Aeolian sandstone. It's hardly surprising that the colluviation off that sandstone onto the slopes is going to be fine grained, well sorted sand. And it's actually colluvium, not uh, Aeolian sand. Now, if we go to a different setting, this is now the, the Bushveld Basin right up in the, the north. And this is where Spike McCarthy has, has done some research in the Mondox Hook area. And these are very similar um, hill slope deposits. The terrain morphology is different. And that's why the, the relationship between the terrain and these, these depositional basins and the slopes is quite different. And this is known as the Mondox Hook Formation. But it's the same sort of period, 120,000 years of accretion on these slopes. Now, move now to the coastal areas. What we have is the Zululand Coastal Basin. And then further down the coast, we've got the Algoa Basin, the Bredasdorp Basin, and up here into the west coast. Uh, similar sort of sediments. And these have actually been described a lot better than most of the deposits in the interior. We have the Maputland group, the Elgo group, Bedarsdorp group, Sandfeld, and then the West Coast group. I'm just gonna have a quick look at some of these that, that I've worked on. Um, the stratigraphy is quite well known. And I think it's important in these areas because you're looking at long periods of time when we know that there has been eustatic sea level rise associated with global climatic change that's influenced the accumulation of these different deposits, that this has been superimposed on epirogenic uplift. Now, some people have modeled this as short pulses of large uplift, up to 900 meters for uplift. But the recent work that's carried out on, on deposits in these areas is suggesting that at the moment, we've been having a fairly consistent five meters of uplift over a million years. And who knows how long this sort of cryogenic uplift has been constant through our area. If we go into the Maputland area, um, the Maputland coastal plain, here we have the Lobombo Mountains, Chassini Dam, Maputu Bay, and this is the Maputland coast going through Cozy Bay, Lake Sabaya to St. Lucia. I was involved in remapping this area, there's I think 18, one in 50,000 sheets, and come up with a new representation of the geology of these areas. 
And if we go back to the old maps, sorry, get back here. This is quite a new interpretation of the geology of these areas. And right at the end of the mapping, Council for Geoscience flew the area for AeroMag and Airborne Radiometrics. And it was nice to be able to have this interpretation of the radiometrics of this area, which gives a very good idea of the uranium, thorium, and potassium content. And this is largely related to uh, sediment transported down the Mkuzi River here, along the Pongola River up here. And this, is, this material has been reworked and it has this very strong radiometric signature that then gives an idea and it picks out different areas of the topography. Now, these have been picked out quite nicely by the stratigraphy on our previous map. There's that same feature there, Muzi North and Muzi South. What it also shows that you just can't take this radiometric data at face value. It certainly does pick up areas and hints at a different um, sediment source in those areas, but you find areas like this where underneath these dunes of the Kombinombi formation, you have a different radiometric signature and we've got to start looking now at why is that different. Now, this work is ongoing. We've, We've got the geological map, we've got the radiometrics, now we're going to start to try and marry the two. Now, these new series of one of 50,000 sheets look like this, it gives a, an idea of what the topography looks like. And on some of them, it shows the radiometric uh, map. This is a bit further south than, than where the radiometrics are done. It also helps to interpret some of the different features that you see on these maps. One of the features of that area is that it's flat. Um, there is no bedrock exposed. And all you've got to deal with is these different colors of windblown sand. And it's the pedogenic overprint of these sands by weathering. So over time, if you take the youngest sands, they've weathered the least. And over time, as you go back, the sands start to reflect the longer period of weathering that they've been exposed to. So these oldest late Neogene Pliocene sands have seen well over 4 million years worth of weathering. Um, all the ferromagnesic minerals have broken down. A lot of the feldspars are broken down. You've had clay in your formation, and that differentiates the sands from some of the younger ones. And that's what I used in this area to try and assist with the mapping now, combining that with the distinct terrain morphological expression of these different sands of different ages. If you look at the Neogene, um, you have the lower formation, which is mainly beach deposits, but also these shallow subtidal channel deposits, um, and then overlain by Aeolian deposits, which were probably Calcarinites in their day, the Amkulani formation, but Late neogene weathering has changed that. It's dissolved the carbon throughout this, most of the succession. And across the surface, all you get is now this, what's called the Berea red sand down towards Durban. I'll show you slides of that. But in this area, it's a very distinct weathering profile called the Ndumu weathering profile. Closer to the coast, you have the Port Durnford formation. And this is probably. 400,000 years old. Um, it relates to marine isostope stage 11, which is important because it's a period when the climate was probably very similar to what you have today. And the sediments there, the Cozy Bay Formation, are the overlying dune sands that bury the Port Durnford um, estuarine deposits, and it's composite. It's a long period of time. We have lost lost uh, interglacial deposits here, burying um, sediments which are very different and they from the period after the uh, MIS-11. And then much of the most Maputland coastal plain, there's these rather boring gray 
yellowish brown sands, the Kwambanambi formation, and luminescence dating by Naomi Peratz of the Israeli Geological Survey has given us a sparse framework of luminescence dates, which helps to explain the dune forms in that area, which accumulated from about 60,000 years ago until about 7,000 years ago. And you see the pedogenesis associated with those particular dune stands is much more limited. In this case, it's just um, what we call uh, pedogenic lamellae with the translocation of clay and um, some iron oxides through that profile. And if you go to the coast, you have the youngest phase of sediment accretion, and these are the Sabai formation dunes. They probably started accreting about 10,000 years ago. That's before sea level reached its present um, elevation after the last glacial maximum. And it's uh, at least four phases of sediment accretion onto those coastal uh, dune ridges. Now the dating gives us an idea of periods of accumulation. And you can see that certain, the Sabai formation is, is generally very young. Whereas the Kwambanambi formation, there's some back to 60,000, but the majority is in this area. And then you go back to um, Cozy Bay, extending back even further. And then something I haven't shown here is the Kalkaranites along the coast, Cozy Bay, and, and they're also quite distinct. So all this aeolian sand movement going on, on the coastal plain, different areas at different times. If you go down towards Durban now, it's a very different situation. South of Imtanzini, uh, the coastline morphology changes and what you have is the, it's known as the Berea sand ridge. And at the base of it is the remnants of those Neogene beaches. And these are at 90 meters above sea level, a stacked sequence of beach, boulder beach gravels, but they've been very weathered under this barrier weathering profile. And all that's left is the most resistant Natal group quartzite boulders and the rest dolerite, granite, arcosic sandstones have all broken down and now form part of the matrix of these deposits. Um, this area in Durban, uh, overlying the Peter Marysburg formation shale, once again, the resistant regolith or the resistant part of the regolith is all that's really preserved in situ. Um, and this was an important site because cosmogenic isotope dating was used to produce an age of about, I think it was about two and a half million years for this site at 60 meters above sea level. As we go down the coast, we'll show you the equivalent material near Port Elizabeth, and that's at a high elevation with an older age. And whereas the, the Berea sand only really addressed the, the res, red sand residual of weathered aeolianite, it's actually a composite weathering profile. There's a very rare view of in situ um, aeolianite above 60 meters above sea level. And it's been decalcified here to produce this red sand weathering profile, very characteristic. But what you see in this area is that even the red sand starts to be influenced by pedogenic weathering and that breaks down and you have iron mobilized out of that and deposited cementing the top of the underlying barrier red sand profile. So these regolith profiles are always composite. As you move further down the coast, the wild coast, there's a bit of an a discussion going on, what should represent the patches of Aeolian sand that you find on the wild coast? Should they be correlated with the Maputlan group or should we look at them more the, as um, thinner rep development of the Algo group, which you find down in the Eastern Cape? He has a site at Port St. John's. This is the edge of the airstrip above Port St. John's. You see it's about 375 meters above sea level. And here is a Misikaba formation quartzites. And this is a paleo shoreline where some of the rock was in situ and some of it had been locally transported. And then amongst there, you find these rounded boulders as well, which you associate with 
these marine beaches. But now if you look at the elevation of the equivalent rocks associated with what we know is the Ulloa formation, Neogene, um, mid-Miocene to probably Pliocene, it's at much lower elevations. So here we have these interesting, probably wave cut platforms at 375 meters, 190 meters. And the question is, uh, Chris Redring called this the uh, he, 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 he regarded it as an equivalent of the Alexandria Formation down in the Eastern Cape, whereas this is actually very similar to what we have, the residual marine boulder and pebble gravel at the base of the uh, Maputland group. So the question, of, do we call it the Mount Tessiga? Because there's nothing uh, well preserved. It's all just the weathered residua. We move now further south from East London, all the way down to Mossel Bay area is the Algoa group. Uh, this was described by Yoko LaRue way back in the early 90s. But I'm just going to focus on some of the more recent work that was done. And this was all associated with the seismic hazard assessment of the taste print nuclear site. And Catherine Hansen led a team that was looking at these marine terraces. And here at the old brickworks in the Sundays River uh, near Port Elizabeth was a date of 3 million years derived from this platform, which is sitting at 51.6 meters above sea level. So that's about a million years older than what we regard as the equivalent platform sitting under Durban, which is at about 60 meters. So these dates, not always exact. And then under the taste print site itself, a lot of drilling was done. Uh, Debbie Clarson published this work based on that, that, that drilling, and it gives an idea of the buried marine terraces associated with the neogene deposits that you find in that area. Um, good records of association of these dated surfaces with the sea level curve. That's going back to that same one we're talking about, MIS-5E, the last interglacial, and then the stepwise marine regression associated with that down to the last glacial maximum around 20,000 years ago, and then sedimentation and erosion associated with the rise of sea level back to present sea level. And in KZN, what you're finding at this time was accretion of Sabai formation dunes onto the coastal barrier. Then if we go further along the South, South Cape coast, I'm not going to address this very much because you had a recent talk by Jean Milan, which would have explained it very nicely. But a lot of dating has been done of these deposits. Those are age estimates that weren't available to Jean when he was doing this work. And it's introduced some interesting new aspects. And there's certainly um, scope to go back and look at the stratigraphy of that Bredarstorp group and add in some extra formations because MIS-11 deposits at so between 9 and 13 meters have been discovered in this area. There's also work done that's picked up this area, these what they call cover sands, which are probably associated with the Bredarstorp group but didn't really form part of the initial description. So there's still work to be done in these areas. But we benefited a lot from the wilderness area, all the dating of those different dune cordons around there. Some new work that's been published. Um, Charles Helm is, lives in Canada. He comes out and he's been looking at the block fall off the coastal cliffs of, of Aeolianite down the southern Cape Coast and finding quite a few sites with hominid human footprints in them. And it's not just the human footprints. There's this whole game reserves worth of different animal footprints. Yeah, the, in the one outcrop, they've identified rhino, elephant footprints, longhorn buffalo, giant cape horse. 
and probably the most remarkable is scratched into the surface of Aeolian deposits. And this is now man, 120,000 years ago, drawing graffiti of the female reprodu reproductive system. This has just been published quite recently and it's worthwhile having a look at. Go further south again to the False Bay area. Dave Roberts done a lot of work in this area. And just by looking at the detail that's exposed in those calcareous deposits, you realize that the weathering that occurs here is at a much lower intensity than what you find in the tropical areas in KZN. And therefore you've actually had some preservation of calcareous sediments and all the associated structures. And these are readily datable, giving a much better idea of the age of accretion in those areas. If you go up the West Coast, he has work that was date, done by Brian Chase dating these um, dune plumes all the way up the west coast using luminescence. It's a very high density of luminescence dates that have been produced. And what he's found there is a very strong association of specific buckets of periods when sand was accreting to form those dune plumes on the west coast. And they very much associated with this record the interpretation of wind strength from the marine records. Now, we don't have the sort of marine records detail along the, the East Coast, and, um, but we presume it gives us an idea that certainly when you have periods when dunes were accreting, that it was probably related to higher wind strength. Let's take a move now away from the coastal areas into the most extensive Cenozoic deposits in the country, in the Kalahari, <coughs> the southern Kalahari, and then the geomorphic province here, which is well defined, it's the, the lower Val and Orange Valleys. Very distinct area at the southern margin of the Kalahari geomorphic province. What sort of deposits do we find there? Well, southern Kalahari is a very distinct dune field. Um, it's at the southern extent of this much larger Kalahari Basin, which extends right the way through Angola into the DRC. And a lot of work has been done by Oxford on dating the characteristic Kalahari dunes in that area. In, case in, in the Northern Cape, we don't have many ages uh, OSL ages for these dunes. But if you look at some of the other areas, they know they've even been able to cluster very nicely. Look at the period over which dune accretion was accumulating um, in the southern Kalahari. And some of these ages go way back into the 200,000 year period. But the majority of the dunes that we see in this Gordonia formation dune field, the top of the Kalahari group, um, we're accumulating over the last 30, 40,000 years. But bearing that, here's the Gordonia dunes, is this much thicker succession of fluvio lacustrine deposits. And for a long time, based mainly on borehole records, it's been subdivided into the Eden Formation, the Buden Formation, and then the basal um, gravels here which you don't really see exposed at the surface. And the mapping by Marion Thomas in this area in the Northern Cape identified the Macallanan calcrete. And this was a bit of a break from tradition in that the Macallanan calcrete identified as a formation. Whereas in the stratigraphy previously, the calcretes haven't been given formal lithostratigraphic status because they are an overprint of the geology in that area. And you can have calcrete cementing bedrock as well as um, the regolith. But what you find is that generally, in this case, that calcification has occurred in one particular formation. So this is a very good indication of a hiatus in the accretion of sediments in the Kalahari Basin. Now, if you look at the, the dating of crustal movements associated with those um, 
flexures, lines of relative uplift and subsidence, the, the Kalahari Basin has been forming since the late Cretaceous. The recent work has been done, and this is in, in the Mamatuan mine area. It's a very thick Kalahari succession. There's the Gordonia formation at the top. The base there is about 60,000 years ago. But the co cosmogenic isotope dates are suggesting that this sediment accumulated in the last 1 million years. So you start to wonder now, well, what happened to the other 60 million years preceding? Um, where did that sediment go to? And then the Buden formation, also the cosmogenic isotopes dates suggest that the the wetland environment in which these argillaceous sediments accumulated was probably um, in existence for about 400,000 years before that, taking us way back to 1.6, 1.8 million years ago. Now, there's only one of two dates available, and I think we need to start looking more carefully at these upper units to see uh, is there a fossil record that can be found. Um, at the moment, not much known. Now, with the mapping that we've been doing in the Griqualand West area, there's Katu. Um, this is around Olifant's Hook, identifying or mapping these Gordonia dunes. But what you find is in the inter dune streets is wetland deposits. And the earliest work that was done in this area, they, they said there are two ages of calcrete. Now, the calcrete that's cementing the upper Eden formation. The Macallan and calcrete, that's probably a neogene calcrete, but along the, inter the, 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 dr the drainage lines, you find a lot of these laminated diatomaceous sediments that have been calcified. And um, this is a younger generation of calcretes that you also find throughout the Kalahari to the north, and they're known as valley calcretes. And the dating that we've been doing on this, the ages are all quite similar anything from 20,000 through to about 24,000 years ago. And the structures, this is now looking in plan view, many of these young calcretes have these vertical tube hollows in them. It's probably related to uh, diatomaceous sediments accumulating, accumulating around the rhizoliths and the stems of reed beds that grew in these wetlands at the time. Uh, remember, these areas that currently receive, if they're lucky, about two or 300 mils of rain a year. And it's quite interesting to find these thick wetland successions accumulating in an area that is now a sand sea. Here's some of the typical structures again. You see they've always got this vertical structure, and that's these uh, reed uh, stem hollows. And in this particular site, and this is at the head of the Khamakhara Valley, what you have is a gravel, and this is a cobble gravel, some locally some boulders, but all of these gravel clasts are actually calcrete clasts. It's one of the few areas I've ever seen where you've got ev evidence of reworking of regolith as part of a younger regolith profile. So this obviously has tremendous stratigraphic value it's just so poorly exposed and very few places where you can see it. If you look at the southern margin of that Kalahari sand sea, here, here comes the orange past Prisca, going north and then through to the Uppington area. And it's, it's evident that these Gordonia dunes seem to extend down south over the Orange Valley. If you take an analogy of this, you look at the northern part of the Namib Sand Sea. John Ward did a lot of his PhD work in that area. And there are very old Namib deposits. But even in a small river like the, the Kweseb, there's no evidence to show that dunes ever crossed the Kweseb River um, in the Quaternary. And you start to wonder now if there's dunes south of the orange, did these dunes ever cross the orange? And considering it's the largest catchment in Southern Africa, I think it's highly unlikely. So 
a lot of these dunes must have been derived locally from the Orange River. We'll have a look at a couple of sites. Um, later on, I'm also going to go into this area. This is where Mike DeVitt had done his PhD in some of these areas, Van Veik's Flay into the, uh, the Coa River Valley. And across here, I think that might be the Kua Kopa that we looked at earlier and these dunes in the Fall Pits area. A beautiful photograph, this. We go up towards Posmasberg on the southern edge of that Kalahari. Here we've got the, um, the Long Berger going up into the Korana Berger. Uh, there's the Witsant dunes, but this is a very distinct Gordonia formation sand sea. And this area down south of the mountains shows that the area is covered by dunes. If you look at that, it's actually a valley and it shows they've mapped some terraces here. If we take a, an oblique view from uh, at the Google Earth imagery, what you can see is that along this valley, it's definitely not all dunes. And here are these calcretized deposits. And what this is, is a calcified wetland that it formed at this point where the bedrock topography is the narrowest. And what it seems is that over time, occasionally, the Gordonia dunes or the early Gordonia dunes have actually blocked this valley and led to the formation of a periodic wetland in this area. And this is now what I call the Wedge Hill Formation. It's a 20 meter succession of calcified wetland deposits. You can see it here on the other side of the, of the Cyclope Valley. And it's been incised by the river and separated into these two, set, two distinct areas. Now, this gives us a very good idea of what was happening at the time. This, you can call this the, the proto-Kalahari sand sea deposits because there were wetlands. Um, there was calcification. This is the regional hard pan calcrete. But what you find is that there's these thin, um, diatomaceous and they calcified deposits, diatomites also calcified. Um, there are interbedded red sands, brown sands, and even gray clay deposits that are buried by calcified diatomites. Um, once again, calcified diatomite, and you can see this typical vertical structure. So much of this was accumulating in, in uh, probably plier environments on the edge of ephemeral wetlands and uh, reed beds were accumulating. These are palustrine environments. Palustrine carbonate environments have been well described elsewhere in the world. Um, you can see the rhizoliths associated with these uh, diatomaceous deposits and even locally buried red sand, which is, suggests to me that there were dunes active in the area and periodically and when the lake dried out, these dunes were able to migrate across the lake floor, but the lake was in, the lake basin was inundated again. Five minutes, base, Greg. Sorry? Five minutes, Greg. Okay. Then at the base is a gravel deposit, uh, which gives us an idea that this was actually a perennial stream at one point. Another section also shows very well de developed palustrine features. He has mud cracks and uh, what's happened now is the cracks have actually calcified and the mud is weathered out. And there was obviously life in these basins, lots of feeding traces from um, other worms or possibly some sort of beetle. And once again, those vertical structures with this well-defined hold pattern in uh, plan view. But then at the base, buried Aeolian sand horizons. And we've done some dating. The dating using TTOSL, which extends the, the limit of optically stimulated luminescence dating back to about 450,000. And the reason why we're getting these weird dates is we're at the limit of that technique. Always searching for different ways of dating the succession. So uh, paleomagnetic dating was done and it shows that there is a sequence of reversals if you look back in time, 
these reversals go back way back. This is 780,000 years ago. So it suggests that the, um, the normal and reverse polarity that we've seen here can be compared with a sequence that's been dated in the Bonnevar cave, which goes back a million years. Uh, the paleomagnetic data suggests that these TTOSLs dates are an underestimate. And there are some MSA artifacts associated with the succession, but not in situ in weathering phenomena, cast features related to incision of the valley. So it gives us an idea that we're dealing with a succession here that could go back a million years. Now, if you consider that the Eden formation at the top of the Kalahari towards the north has been dated at one 1 million to 1.6 million years. Are we dealing with the different facies then of the Eden formation? This work's only just started and I hope to continue this as my research interest during my retirement. Um, lastly, just looking at the dunes plumes. This is uh, Prisca, upstream from Prisca and you can see on this incised topography, these well-defined dune plumes. Uh, these are locally derived. There are Gordonia dunes in this topography in these mountains, but no sign that they've crossed the, the orange. These are locally derived. And if you look at the map here, we've got these meanders with the Riverton Formation Terrace, these small little brown dunes, short linear dunes that are migrating up the valley sides. But if you look at the distribution of sediment away from the river, I suspect this has been going on for a long period of time, and it's probably related to the period of formation of the, um, or the younger part of the formation of the Vol River terraces in this area. Uh, you know, the, the map shows QS, that's typical for these areas, undifferentiated, but if you look at the extent of these dunes, this is just the dunes, whereas this is the Riverton fluvial terrace deposits. So this research is starting to provide some basis for subdividing the Cenozoic in these areas. You can see here, the terraces are used for agriculture and that's center pivot irrigation, very nicely defining the boundary of the Riverton formation and separating it from these young dune deposits. Um, on the surface, not much to look at. There's a hard pan calcrete formation, this very thin sand, no dune forms preserved. So I suspect that these dunes accreted and have been weathered and degraded over a long period of time. Henny, do you want me to stop there? It's up to you, Greg. You can just finish up there. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Oh, is the Zoom link going to cut out now? No, 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 you carry on. No. Carry on. You can have another five minutes. Go. Okay. Let's just zoom quickly further down the orange to an area where we've been doing mapping now in the Orange Valley and in Bushman land uh, between Porfada and Springbok. And the, the development of Cenozoic deposits or Quaternary regolith in this area is actually quite um, complex. Much of the area from the surface is just these, what they call pediments with thin sheet wash sand cover um, on the upper or the base of the, the hills, you might find a quartz rich uh, gravel, but this is just thin quartz sand that covers much of the area. As you go down towards the incised interflues, what you find is the streams are cutting in and here's weathered granite, but it's not weathered to any great depth. Um, and these pediment surface deposits theoretically are quite young. If you look at them in, in plan, here we have the red sands. You can distinguish the, the thin sand cover from the areas where the granite saprolite is exposed. And then in these areas, you've got these quite well-defined, but very shallow uh, ephemeral fluvial channels. And they might not look like much on the surface when you're there when it's dry, but clearly this is where everything happens after it rains. And this makes those channels very important. Also gives you an idea that on these pediment surfaces, that there's also fluvial activity in addition to the sheet wash activity that's contributed to the accumulation of these pediment cover deposits. And they can be quite thick in places. Here we've got 
I think it's nearly 15 meters, and it's alternating coarse sands and pedogenic calcretes, a whole sequence of them. In, site, in situ buried in there are these calcified termite deposits. It's an important succession to look at. Um, we talk about the Namaquiland and the mineral resources in that area. There's not much mining going on. And quite frankly, the, the most valuable mineral commodity in Namaquiland right now is this sheet wash colluvium, which is hosting these incredible table grape and um, date palm orchards. Now, adjacent to those areas, in a way, this is going further south. Springbok is across here on the left are these very well-defined areas and they show up very red in the satellite imagery. And these have been incised by the present stream valleys, giving us an idea of the antiquity of the deposits that are there. And what these are, are doorbank cemented sheet wash colluvial deposits. Um, and there's a whole range of these deposits, which gives you the idea that this is probably a paleo land surface and you have alluvial fan gravels that have been cemented by the Dordbank. Here's Talus below a quartzite ridge, also cemented by the Dordbank. Mostly, though, it's these coarse sand deposits, and they've been cemented, rubified. Um, the matrix is cemented by remobilized silica. And then there's subsequent accumulation of carbonate. That's quite difficult when you're finding these to try and relate these to the more extensive calcrete deposits in the area. And what's the difference between these silcrete cemented deposits and the uncemented pediment sed sediments that I showed you previously? Something else that you get in these areas is these hevelkies. Now, these are areas where you've had pedogenic accumulation of carbonates and also neo formation of clays like sepialite and paligorskite associated with what I've regarded as termite mounds. Now, in the previous slide, I showed you how you get these buried termite mounds. Is it possible that <coughs> these hubble keys in the Northern Cape represent a former landscape that's not active at present? Not enough work has been done. We need to do a lot more work to, to be able to relate to this and then figure out the stratigraphic importance of these hevel keys in association with the adjacent areas. Okay, Henny, I think I'll leave it there. There's plenty that we can discuss. Thank you very much. Could you put your video back on and then we can start talking. Thank you very much for a most okay. interesting one. Thanks, Greg. That's fantastic. So when's the book coming out? Oh. Hmm? Why are you laughing? It's going to be in a series of map explanations. Okay. Well, I think we need some a couple of decent books for, for the ordinary person like us to go and actually see some of these things. Take we've got to take it down to the to the sort of um, you know lay person and um, scholar level. Yep. You know, and in, in studying the, the regolith of such a wide area, I liken it to, to the type of movement that you get in a kaleidoscope. As you travel across the landscape, this, mm. the landscape is changing constantly and the sediments that are associated with it are changing constantly. And there's no continuity laterally in the regolith to be able to directly relate what you saw an hour ago with what you're seeing in the landscape that you're passing at the moment. And in another hour's time, it's going to be different again. So you've got to do this very extensive mapping to get an idea of the 3D um, framework of the regolith across any particular area. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a critical point, Greg, and no disrespect to you know, our, our, our previous teachers and that, but I think um, some of us in this country got used to just good old flat-lying stratigraphy and you know, drew drew lines across everything. Now suddenly, you know, all of this stuff of yours comes along and it's, as you say, you go around the next corner, it's different, but it's related. Um, and, and, and really we need to, you know, start looking at this, um, this whole young layer as a, as a really critical part of our, our, our land resource, for example. And, and obviously the challenges that go with it, like the Berea red sand. In, anyway, let's get some some discussion and questions going. But fantastic, thank you. 
Right. Is, is Michael gone off to his his appointment? Who's who else is? Bill, have you got any comments from a from a diamond point of view? Yeah, John, just um, question <clears throat> off actually, but can I ask uh, mention of things if you don't mind? Yeah, go for it, Mark. Yeah. Uh, First, a couple of things actually, but uh, it's quite interesting, Greg, talking about the, the bits of silkcrete lying around. We, I'm busy going back to the Northern Cape and uh, Bushland and so on, and found quite a lot of areas where we pick up bits of silkcrete, uh, obviously related to your, um, your African surface that is, uh, that's just been, been knocked on the head a bit. Um, and, then, and then I think uh, what I find interesting is obviously Craig didn't talk much about the the Miocene and the Pliocene so on, but there are large areas that uh, that I think needs needs to be incorporated, could be incorporated. Um, but an area that I think uh, we're, we're looking at is, is this copper area as well. I was there last week, actually, uh, again. And um, there's a wealth of information coming out of these crater fessies of these melanoites sitting on either side of the Cretaceous boundary. And um, there, there are numerous fossils now being found uh, in the last year or so that will add a lot of information on that uh, critical time period. Anyway, I've, I have to leave it there because I've got to shoot to my appointment, but uh, it was a great talk. Greg. Thanks very much. Cheers, Mark. I think John, okay. Rogers is, John Rogers has got his mic unmuted. He's surely going to be wanting to talk to us. Okay. Um, what I want to ask, if the rim fuss mark falls and we're at an hour dry waterfall, does that come into your bigger picture of a much wetter climate and then suddenly the area has got a pretty dry climate? I've never actually been to the rim fuss mark falls, but I'd love to go because I think it's such a symbolic thing that Horton highlighted. John, I was amazed when I first started mapping up in that area, Onsia Kans, north of Porfada. You're yeah. mapping in a very arid area and finding barrage tufa deposits and tufa waterfalls from tributaries down into the Orange River. Mm. And then if you look at the, the period that you've had sheet wash activity moving sediments across that landscape, there's obviously been periods where there was a much higher rainfall. Um, in that area as well, you've got the, the old Kua River Valley and Mark David did his PhD on the Klein Flay Formation, but also looking at the Suck River terraces and then at Borsleys Pan, the Miocene um, fluvial deposits. And that goes back to 17 million years ago. So there have been major rivers that have been transporting sediment, fluvial sediment into the orange over that whole period, but they've all been buried now. Mm. Okay, thank you. So my request, Greg, is that uh, I think everybody here will agree that you know you're doing it justice by cramming it into one hour. You've got such fantastic slides and so much knowledge about each area. I think you should consider putting it in two different presentations, and then sometime next year we we do it again. Yeah, there's probably more than I could add. Yeah. And everybody I appreciate says, all the people who have. Connected, I see here Tanya Marshall, Duncan Miller, gee, Bill McKechnie, all people I've bumped into in the past many years ago. Bill is just looking for a, a quiet spot in the airport. He's, I think he still wants to talk to us. Just give him okay. a minute or two. Otherwise, any other ones? I'll say Anthony. Okay, guys, well, if, if Bill is not going to come through, you've got a couple of more seconds to pose your questions now. Right, I think you've been so informative, guys. I have nothing to ask you. Thank you very, very much again, Greg. And uh, as I say, I hope I'm looking forward to, to looking at this again next year. More detail over two parts. You, you're committed already. Okay. And in that, uh, as, as a last note, you guys, we're we, we running off the year with a very liquid form of a presentation. 
about the relationship with whiskey with the earth that you know on which it was um, produced and, and mixed into so uh, that will be our last talk next thursday thank you very much greg and everybody have a good day and a, and a merry christmas if you don't coming to the next one thanks any thanks john cheers everybody <laughs>